Today we're looking at Matthew 27, verses 62 through 66. It's entitled in the ESV, The Guard at the Tomb, which is ironic because Christ had already died and his disciples had fled, and yet the chief priests and the Pharisees were asking a pilot permission to go and set a guard there in case the disciples were to come back. Uh, that simply wasn't something that was likely to happen, but they continued to oppose this movement that had built around Christ even after his death. Ultimately, we see that what they intended for evil to try to oppose Christ and people coming to believe in Christ, God used for good. And it's very similar to the account of Joseph uh, from which that saying comes, what, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Now, to paraphrase that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But Verse 62 in chapter 27 of Matthew. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So we see that the disciples, they weren't coming back. Uh, the, the man that they had followed all this time and that they put all their trust in had died and they didn't understand and they left. But the Pharisees set this guard and they sealed the stone. And by doing so, they established the, the truthfulness of the claim that Christ truly raised from the dead. The fact that there was opposition there, people trying to prevent anyone from coming, made it even more clear when Christ did rise from the dead that his resurrection was genuine, on top of all the appearances that he made uh, to people and when he, when he was touched by them, when he ate food in their presence. We see that this is very similar to the account of Joseph, where his brothers also opposed him and they threw him into a pit and they had wanted to kill him. They told uh, their father that, that, they had, that he had died. But we see that all the evil that happened to Joseph, all the suffering that he went through, and even the suffering that was caused by his brothers, although they meant it for evil, God used it for good. And although the Jewish people, specifically the, the chief priests and the Pharisees here, Jesus' brothers, the, his fellow Jews, um, his, his people, even though they meant for evil these actions, God used it for good uh, by making clear the miracle of the resurrection, making it even more undoubtable because of what they did to try and prevent anything from happening, that the stone was rolled away and that the guards couldn't stop what was going to happen, and none of the actions that they took were able to stop what God was going to do. Some application that we see from this it's very reminiscent of James chapter 1. And you can look there if you will. Right near the beginning it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And perfect and complete as in having the virtues and the good things that the Lord wants us to have. Uh, summarized by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, not lacking in any of these things, not lacking in wisdom. When we go through these trials, uh, it's reminiscent of, of this passage because Jesus was put into the tomb even though he had already suffered death on the cross. It didn't end immediately. And that's kind of the point I'm drawing out here. And in the account of Joseph that was prefiguring the coming of Christ, it didn't end immediately for Joseph. It lasted a very long time, and he suffered many things. When Jesus cried out, It is finished, he didn't rise immediately, though he died. It was three days until he would rise. And in the trials that we also face, sometimes... They last longer than we would like. But James is reminding us that even when we come into these trials, and we know that trials, to be even considered a trial, it's going to last 
longer than people would really want it to. But when we come and meet these trials, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, this firmness in your faith. When you get through to the other side of these trials and of these difficulties, when it, even when you don't understand what's going on, as Mary didn't understand, who was weeping uh, near the tomb, as the disciples didn't understand, as John didn't understand, and not fully, but even when it's difficult to know what's going on, if we continue to trust in God, if we continue to persevere through the trials, we come out stronger on the other side. When Christ suffered his death, when he rose, he was the first fruits of the resurrection. And by going through that trial, he brought about salvation for the world. When Joseph suffered through all the trials that he went through, uh, but he continued to trust in God, God used him to bring deliverance to his people Israel uh, through saving up the food for the time of famine that would come by understanding and interpreting the dream uh, to the Pharaoh. Whenever we're going through trials in a very similar way, if we continue to have faith in God, God works in us those trials to produce steadfastness in our faith, that firmness. And James warns us, let it have its full effect. Don't despair. Don't give up. Don't leave Leave off putting your faith in Christ during those times. Don't give in to, to sorrow that leads to, to murmuring and muttering, and as the people of Israel did when they were uh, wandering in the wilderness. Instead of putting their trust in God, and instead of praising Him as Paul and Silas did when they were put into the prison, uh, they, they gave in to, to thoughts of despair, of wanting to turn back. Instead, instead of giving in to those things, which can be a real temptation, or to let steadfastness have its full effect so that we can be perfect and complete. And this perfection obviously isn't talking about complete moral perfection, but it's talking about being the fully equipped servant of God that Christ has called us to be. And God uses those trials as he did with Joseph, as ultimately as he did with Christ, and in our own lives. When we go through these trials, God brings about good through them. So we can continue to have faith, uh, even when we don't understand. So these are some of the lessons that I wanted to, to draw out from Christ's time in the tomb. And when he was still being opposed, when his disciples didn't understand. Uh, but, but we can continue to have faith in God, even in such circumstances. Just as Christ was able to know for sure, after three days I will rise, we can also know for sure, whatever trial we're going through, God works all of it to our good, to those of us who are the called according to his purpose.